Iggy Pop's an iconic figure in the story of rock and roll. With his band, The Stooges, he came storming out of Detroit at the end of the 60s, trashing the ideals of the hippie movement and laying the ground rules for the punk revolution that followed in his wake. 30 years after their last gig, Leo Burley's film follows Iggy and The Stooges on their reunion tour, and we look back at his extraordinary career. He's now 57. He's survived drug addiction, mental breakdown, and long-term financial problems. He remains one of rock's most explosive live performers. a performance that would exercise, not to say completely knock out, somebody about half or a third your age. How do you prepare for that physically and why do you push yourself so hard? It's just something uh, in a certain kind of music uh, that suggests the way the song should be performed. And if it's going to get physical, then it's going to get physical. Uh, I think it was Elvis that said, you know, I can't help myself, you know, there's sort of some of that, there's a lot of that to it. performances either it's a high calculation of theatricality or you get in some way possessed you just the, the music you've talked about a feeling coming up in you hitting the back of your neck exploding in your head yeah. and there is a sort of feeling that you transmit to the audience of being somebody who's got to discharge this fury energy whatever it is do you feel that you, you, yes i hope so <laughs> Yeah, and there, it comes from uh, it comes from a lot of different places. It comes from the nature of amplified music. Now I'm ready to close my mind. There's a resonance that wasn't there before things were plugged in. Now I'm ready to feel your hand and lose my heart on the burning sand. And then some of it comes, I suppose, from deep childhood problems. You know, that sort of thing, sure. You know, uh, things you, you've got to work out for yourself. Uh, anger, fear, th this sort of thing. And I don't know where that comes from. And then some of it's just good old theater. Well, come on! Iggy Pop was born James Newell Osterberg in 1947 and raised in a trailer park in Ann Arbor, Michigan, just outside Detroit. My parents were lower and middle class economically. They're both educated, uh, university educated. My dad was teaching high school, not making a great deal of money, and my mother was a private secretary. When you look back on that trailer camp, what do you think you got out of it? There were some people from Tennessee up the row of trailers uh, that used to 
asphyxiate chickens on their on the exhaust pipe of their cars for dinner once a week, and also had uh, the teenage son who could play a song, an instrumental called Bulldog. It was popular, sort of a Dwayne Eddy kind of a thing on the guitar at the time, and uh, and I began to get a sense of rock and roll as working people's music. And it triggered something. It also probably gave me a, a certain amount of ambition and maybe a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. You said it triggered something, meeting these uh, the, the people who came and went in the trailer park. What do you think it triggered, to come back to your word? A lot of those people are nicer <laughs> than, than the more accomplished members of our society. Uh, you, can take, you can take the what that infers from there. <laughs> Triggered uh, a respect for simplicity. Yeah. How about that? A respect for simplicity. I am you. I am you. I am you. And when did you start being really passionate about not only music, because so many people were, but actually doing it yourself? When I was 13 and began going to school in the comfortable town in Ann Arbor, started to meet kids who had guitars, amplifiers, Ray Charles albums. Whoa! <laughs> Whole albums of Dwayne Eddy and Elvis. And then I, then I, I got seriously corrupted. Jim Osterberg became the drummer of the Iguanas, hence his nickname Iggy. His friends still call him Jim. For a high school band, the Iguanas were very successful, releasing a cover of a Bo Diddley hit. huge response in school. People knew me. <laughs> you know, all this sort of, the usual sort of response. Hey, I'm popular. It began to dawn on me that any sort of serious career in the real world that I chose was going to be a continuation of what I was experiencing in high school. I was going to sit in some oppressive room on a beautiful day and listen to someone talk about something sequentially logical that would just degenerate into a buzz in my head and I, I was gonna feel bad. And I thought, I can't do it, I can't do it. And in, it sort of occurred to me, uh, the general idea of music could be an escape. Iggy became increasingly interested in the blues. And in 1966, he traveled to Chicago to play drums for bluesmen like Big Walter Horton and Johnny Young. I would go out on pickup gigs and uh, either, either play for five bucks when somebody like Johnny Young or Big Walter didn't have a serious gig, when they were going to go play uh, a church social for, uh, for white people who wanted to be politically correct and have a black blues band. This sort of thing, you know, they, they, okay, come on, you can come and play. And I was pretty impressed, you know. I was also impressed by uh, the atmosphere when you go to the bars and I'd see these people playing. It wasn't just, a, wasn't so much about the playing, it was the audience. They were rowdy. And I'd never seen women with such big bottoms. And I'd never seen bottoms moved like that. And I was really, impressed. It was, it was the shit, man. It, it was the shit. I wanted to be like that. But eventually you quit because, as I understand it, you said that black people should play the blues and you moved on for that reason. That I wasn't going to master that particular form or that particular instrument. There are there were people who imitate that better than I was going to. So, but I thought 
I thought that I had a brainstorm. I smoked my first joint down by the Chicago River and uh, sat there and I thought I could take these same themes, these same attitudes, the same sense of space, and I could make white suburban delinquent music. to stumble very badly trying to do that and I had two pretty tough years kind of a lost soul trying to figure out how to do that with some vigor trying to do what you, you learned what from the blues that you wanted to transfer to describing in effect your own life and your own sensation yes and trying to create a new musical form wasn't good enough to just do four garage chords and here comes the hook and it put a put a few words you know or, uh, no a, a new musical form something new enough to work to do that it was going to be necessary to have people who knew even less than i did he called up and said hey i'm I'm in Chicago, I don't want to do this, let's start a band. Jim said, I'm starting Jim's School of Music, and I'm going to teach you guys how to play. We created our own instruments. We'd start off the set with a, a blender with some water in it, and just have a mic over the top and have that play and play before we came out. We just happened to be right there at that perfect time when uh, rock and roll was changing and people were looking for new things, and we were definitely a new thing. Another day. The Stooges weren't technically proficient players. I mean, they, they couldn't, you know, play with a lot of velocity. They didn't have a lot of technique. They didn't have music theory. They didn't know, you know, how some chords develop into other chords. Um, but that wasn't important for what they were trying to do. I found the three finger power chord where you can hit that bar chord. Example, like on No Fun, you can just do the bar and move from the A to the D, and just go, okay, now I have a simple structure to get this big power chord, these three notes enough, so just turn up the volume. And it seemed that that type of simple and powerful stuff is what Jim liked that kind of catapulted him into his stage frenzy. And the crowning jewel was, of course, Iggy's performance. He danced with the music, and he had his own body rhythms, and he had a way of moving in the music that was uh, compelling. You couldn't take your eyes off him. We had never seen anyone dance like that. At that stage, you said earlier that what you wanted was to do something new. Mm -hmm. now, were you, did you feel that the three of you were on the way to doing something new then? Yeah, we had th the two songs, No Fun and I Want to Be Your Dog. The sound was new. Nobody ever, nobody sounded quite like that. It wasn't, but it was close enough to what some people at the vanguard of music then were doing that I thought, well, there must be 50,000 people in America who could hear this. The Stooges were spotted by Danny Fields from Electra Records, playing alongside the better-known MC5. He signed them on the spot, and they released their first album in August 1969, in the same week as the Woodstock Festival. And how did it go down? It went down really well and made a very strong impression on a certain minority. And it upset the shit out of the new age corporate structure to be, all of whom had, you know, 
beards and long hair. They hated us. They hated us because a whole new set of people were, were going to come in and beautify America in a peaceful, psychedelic way and, uh, and take over, and it was all a complete lie. And we were kind of messing up the program, and we didn't really realize it. We didn't, we didn't set out to do that. Were they worried about the music, first of all? Did they think, this is not the way music should be going? The common quote was, these guys can't play. <laughs> we couldn't play Johnny B. Good. Now, I'm not sure why we never did get around to mastering Johnny B. Good. <laughs> we could have played Johnny B. Good. But we could play something else. And I think we've got some action coming up now. Uh, we'll leave Bob Waller for the moment and go to the stage and listen to Iggy and the Stooges. She had a TV on me. She had a TV on She had a TV on me. No. Jim had a need to be with the audience, not just stand up there, look off in the distance and sing. He wanted to interact with the people. There goes Iggy right into the crowd. We've lost audio on him. This seems like a good yeah. chance to get a message in. What about your own performances, the diving into the audience, the risk where people again and again said, I don't know what he's going to do next. Uh, he's frightening. I just realized, I think instinctively, that the one thing you don't want to do is get up on that stage if you get the chance and then leave not having made an impression, not having engaged. You're, you're very much engaging the Odyssey, but you're also sometimes even hostile to them, taunting them. At that point, uh, it wasn't really going to work to come out and say, hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, ow, good God, in 25 cities. And I'd see people like totally terrified or totally having fun. And it was like, oh no, he's getting near me. Oh God, what's he gonna do to me? The promoter's wife at the New York State Pavilion had a miscarriage watching Iggy. Uh, so he blamed Iggy for the death of his unborn child, which I thought, this is great. You know, think of all the money we can save. Oh, it was before abortion was legal. That's peanut butter. The people in New York had the decision to make. Is he real? And since he's from a trailer park in Michigan, do we care anyway? And then he played. And that took care of all that. Matt Waller is down in the field with the crowd. I don't know just where, but we'll find him. But I'll tell you something else. I thought nothing will ever happen with them. They'll never, ever sell any records, but oh boy, am I so glad I was here today. I'm just gonna push this a bit because it's All fascinating. Right. This business of feeling that uh, you were possessed, that something just, you let something take you over. So it's both there. staged and it's uh, completely out of control. Is that right? Is it both things? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if it's the, the soul of uh, some half-drunk blues man, <laughs> possibly, I don't know. There's something going on, yeah. Something going on. I don't, know, I don't know how that works, really. Motherfucking piece of shit! TV! When I look at my fucking TV, these are the words I say. Robert!
By 1970, the Stooges had become a more sophisticated musical outfit, and their second album, Funhouse, was inspired by the free jazz experimentation of artists like John Coltrane. But Iggy and Scott Ashen had fallen prey to another less welcome influence. Can you talk a bit about um, where you are and the band are with drugs at that time? What's happening with the drugs and how is it influencing the way you're doing the music? The marijuana was first, and then psychedelics would be something you did on Sunday, sort of thing, once once a week or so. Uh, by the time we were doing Funhouse, it was written still with just marijuana and psychedelics, but uh, by the end of the recording, which took place in Big Bad Los Angeles, uh, uh, cocaine had entered the vocabulary. After the recording, heroin was around. A call in from my fun house with my song. We've been separated, baby, far too long. It escalated from snorting to shooting up. And then what I saw was really just the whole, whole band falling apart. Anyone who's ever been involved in drugs knows after a while that becomes your life more important than anything else and it definitely took away from music it's a shame eventually it you know wrecked wrecked my health uh, mentally and physically and wrecked kind of wrecked what we were doing with the band a fine house boy will steal your heart away. danny fields who was managing us just said, that's it, I can't do anything, it's over. I came back to call Iggy to come and, you know, get ready. His feet were sticking out from under the stall, and uh, I opened the door, and he had a needle in his arm, and blood was coming out, and I had to, like, sprinkle toilet bowl water on him, something to get him up, and um, I thought, this is no good. No! And I said, no, I can't do this. I am you. Broken by his heroin addiction, Iggy quit the Stooges in 1971. During his recovery in New York, Danny Fields introduced him to a young English rock star who was trying to crack the American market. Where did you meet? In a bar. In a bar. New York. In New York. <laughs> yeah. You sure? <laughs> we were both unrecognized at the time, so we had a lot to, you know, in common. But David, right. David was, his star was rising then. Iggy's was not, to put it mildly. And um, David became his benefactor and protector and musical champion. Uh, I'd never seen Jimmy, really, but I'd heard some of his albums. And uh, it sounded like... Uh, uh, I don't know, nihilistic rock. Mm -hmm. It was nihilism. But, but that's true. Which fascinates me. Well, well, I love nihilism. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. <laughs> I think that Bowie was, was very interested in Iggy, mainly because Iggy was American, that he represented sort of the most um, dynamic thing that was happening in American rock and roll. I must keep walking cheetah with a hat full of names. David Bowie and his manager Tony de Vries decided to take Iggy to London to record a third Stooges album, but without the Ashton Brothers. I remember getting a call one day from Jim from London going, well, we tried out a hundred bass players and drummers and no one's really good enough. They just don't fit in. How would you guys like to, uh, to play? I'm going, and I'm going, you know, hundred, it took a hundred drummers and bass players till you finally called us. Somebody gotta save my soul. You came to London to do the, the third and what proved to be a final uh, uh, Stooges album. What do you think of the work on that album? Was that, how is that different from the first two? A new guitarist came in who had who could play Johnny Be Good. He was a troubled youth from the Detroit area, also. 
and named James Williamson. James and Iggy had gone through heroin buddy deals together, you know, and he was, at that time, supposedly a more accomplished guitar player, and Iggy just wanted to try something different. You got honey, cause you're using technology. You got time, made no apology. The music took another step. It was, it was more rhythmically complicated and lyrically provocative. Can and, you talk a bit about Search and Destroy? You know, Search and Destroy yeah. was one. It was a column heading in a Time Magazine article about the war in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, a little chest, yes, Search and Destroy, that's the mission we're going to use on these people now. And uh, this is really going to work because we've got a hell of a military sort of thing. And I thought, let's take that and use it another way because I thought to my, I thought about myself, I thought, aren't I basically a person who is destructive in personal relationships for the greater good of my artistic endeavor? Yeah. The one you search in, search in, to this in the summer of 1972, the Stooges played their one and only London gig at the Scala Cinema in King's Cross. Among those present was John Lydon, soon to be better known as Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols, and a young photographer called Mick Rock. When he hit the stage, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before, and it was very, it was a little intimidating, because he didn't, no, I'd never, well, there hadn't been anybody around that had that attitude that was so in your face and so fuck you and so defiant. I think that's in a way that why people, it, maybe it took people a little time to realize that he was, the progenitor of punk. They started saying uh, that we were the creators of that the punk sound, and I don't know what I think of that. I think it's cool. The idea of punk is to say, fuck you, we don't care. We don't care if you buy our records. We don't care about anything. And Iggy was the first person who actually decided that for himself. Within four years of the Scala gig, the Sex Pistols were doing their own version of No Fun. And back in the States, punk groups like the Ramones hailed Iggy as a major inspiration. David Bowie too had been influenced, and at the end of 1972, he returned to America for the Ziggy Stardust tour, a character partly inspired by Iggy. The Stooges followed him back to the US to finish the Raw Power album and were installed in a luxury mansion in Los Angeles. Give me a danger, little stranger. You went back to LA, and that record, as I understand it, wasn't released for a while. No, for quite a while. Yeah, there was, there were, there were, there was mess piled on mess attending the release of that record. Uh, I became unsound. It was a beautiful lifestyle, but all that waiting around and stuff, and not really doing anything, was hurting us. And then I think there was more drugs. We were in New York getting weird phone calls, like someone broke into the house and stole all the equipment, which seemed a little odd. There were always these, these disasters happening that required immediately sending money. There's nothing in my dream, just some ugly memory. Kiss me like the ocean breeze. Iggy went into a real tailspin and um, a lot of nights lying in the gutter on Sunset Boulevard, you know, with cuts all on his chest and his, in his arms and everything. Although Iggy had often injured himself in performance, as his drug use increased, his stage show became more and more self-destructive, culminating in a very bloody night in 1973. Someone threw a champagne glass on stage and broke, and you know, the stem of the champagne glass is really sharp. And uh, I guess Jim just saw it and picked it up and went at it with his chest, to his chest. Some people would look away, you know, some people would love it. 
I myself, I didn't think he had to do that. I was on a mission basically to, I guess, to destroy the world. And that made it hard to communicate with management who were not, were less likely to throw their weight behind the release of a drugged madman <laughs> than, than, than a, a, going, a going concern. Basically, Tony got fed up and had enough of it, and that was it. Told Lee to get them all out of the house, and goodbye, Iggy. And really, by the time we, by the time the album was out, there we had no relationship with management anymore, and we were just kind of doing odd gigs around. And then you quit the Stooges. Slowly, I quit the Stooges, bit by bit. I realized to do guitar-based music of that sort that was really, really in the vanguard at that time, I'd I'd shot my shot for what I was gonna be able to do, and I was I would ha have to do something else. Enter David Bowie with experimental ideas. After the Stooges finally broke up in 1974, Iggy suffered a nervous breakdown and admitted himself to a psychiatric hospital. David Bowie, himself struggling with cocaine addiction, was one of his only visitors. As I understood it, you turned up at the clinic and said, I'm in a bad way, I want to be sorted out. And then Bowie came to see you, who was in a, himself in quite a bad way. He was jolly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gather he was, in, in a sense, but never, never disorganized. He, he was always exhibited good spirits, uh, uh, and, and I saw him 24-7 for several days at a time <laughs> often, and he, he was together. He was together, but yeah, there was, there was stuff going on, you know. Iggy went on the road with David then. He went on that, that uh, Thin White Duke tour, and then they ended up in Berlin where they both began to kind of rebuild their lives. Got my first glasses there. I started going cross-eyed from the drug use. And the joint was right here, right there. That's the place. And I, I stayed here with David for probably, I think, around a year, a year and a half. I was living, was living with him, and I would write these poems about my the misery and angst I was going through as a basically a, a Ronin. You know, I'd, I'd, had, I'd had a band and it had gone to hell. I had a home that had vanished. I had a culture that was gone, and here I was out there. Were you still on your mission to do something that other people weren't doing? To... Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and I and I had found my boy. Here was somebody very, very talented, and he wanted other outlets. There were certain things that I believe he was able to do with me that he chose not to do under his own flag. We learn dances, brand new dances. He wrote the music to night clubbing. I got very excited and insisted I write a lyric to that. Uh, it wasn't at all rock, you know, and uh, in that case, we used a drum machine. And, and at first he thought, well, gee, that's not, you know, that doesn't sound professional enough, you know. Like, yes, it does, it's good enough for me. <laughs> it's only Iggy fucking pop, you know, it doesn't have to sound, you know. And, and we went for it, and it's that odd little Roland, it sounds, cheap, but it sounds right for the song, you know, and so I tended to egg him on in that way, and he was only too willing to go farther and farther.
in the studio with, that Jimmy would um, make up the lyrics on the spot and we would keep everything that he did mm -hmm. and uh, occasionally change a line after we recorded. But J Jimmy, I'd, I've never seen anybody be able to make up lyrics so fast just out of his That's head to a track. A very spontaneous kind of lyric. It's, it's not like a written thing at all with Jimmy. <laughs> Bowie had less involvement in Iggy's next album, but he did contribute the melody for its title track, one of Iggy's best-known songs. He grabbed a ukulele one afternoon and started at it. He said, now, call that Lust for Life, which uh, I imagine he'd probably, probably gotten from the movie of the book of the painter. And Kirk Douglas doing Van Gogh doing doing torture, <laughs> self-torture, self which fit the artist he was recording. Now listen. Well, now I'm worth a million in prizes. When my torture fell, I got a GTO. I wear a uniform. All out of government law. What song says is that People with real enthusiasms are vulnerable to getting really fucked up, really screwed. Your hair was a loony. Uh, an idiot, if you were, who didn't even, didn't, I didn't even care, I didn't even think about, I didn't have any money anyway. I wasn't going to get any money. I never ever thought about that, so I wasn't thinking about succeeding. And once you drop success, it's amazing what can happen. The collaboration that Jimmy and I have had has been something because I was intoxicated with, uh, with, with what I thought Jimmy stood for and um, I would never ever want it to be considered mm -hmm. that I was some kind of hand manipulator or Svengali behind okay. what Jimmy's doing now because he's getting popular now. Mm -hmm. Was there pressure at this time for you to make your work more commercial? There uh, would have been if I wasn't working with David Bowie. <laughs> with him, not at all. <laughs> None whatsoever. There was an incredible pressure to make good work, to make it good, and there was self-imposed pressure to make it good also in terms of what should be commercial. Yeah. And that's why some of, the, some of the songs became commercial 20, 30 years later. This is way more than a cruise. The Passenger was first released as a B-side in 1977 and didn't make it into the charts. It's now widely regarded as one of the best pop songs of its time. There was part of a poem by Jim Morrison. He basically said, modern life is a journey by car. And he basically says that nobody can really get out of their own car. It's very difficult, but once in a while, you can roll down the window and kind of try to change cars. <laughs> you can't really get out of the bloody car. I am the passenger. And I ride and I ride. I ride through the city's backsides. I see the stars come out of the sky. Yeah, I ride in a hollow sky. You know, it looks so good. In the early 1980s, Iggy moved to New York. Since then, he's released 10 further albums, but few have matched the popularity of his work in Berlin. He's often struggled financially and relied on income from touring. 
This summer alone, the Stooges reunion tour took in 40 venues in 15 countries, and this is their third trip to New York. If you wait long enough, kid, I just, I just got off and they brought me here three and a half hours early. So to everybody who ran this thing, love you, but fuck! Three and a half fucking hours. I tried my best. Fuck! This is the hard part about sustaining a career. You know, to do this for a living, year in, year out, write some more songs, do another record, get another band together, find some new business partners to put your records out. This is the hard work of the life of an artist. What he does for me is like, He's the guy that came from the small town, came to the big city, was looking for something different. You know, that whole search and destroy mission, and then turned it all around, and then you got that guy up there tonight that just takes the crowd by storm. No fun, my babe. No fun. No fun, my babe. No fun. No fun. No fun to be alone, walking by myself. No fun to be alone. Sometimes you achieve iconic status by being the last man standing. By the late 90s, despite a newfound interest in acting and writing, Iggy had become increasingly disillusioned with life in Manhattan. There was a voice going, many voices in New York, inner voices saying, you can't ever leave New York. If you do, you won't be able to promote yourself. You won't be anybody. You won't know what's going on. A lot of people trapped here. Not everybody, but a lot of people feel they need to be here. I don't ever want to feel that way about a place. So I left. In 1998, Iggy moved to Florida. Since then, the use of his music in commercials and films and the royalties from his hits have combined to provide a comfortable income for the first time in his life. But apart from the Rolls Royce, he lives modestly in a one-bedroomed house in a suburb of Miami. Have you ever felt you wanted to get out of the music business and concentrate on acting and just writing? You've been through periods where you've felt like giving up time and again, haven't you? I get... Every once in a while, if I'm really, when I'm really tired or I've hit a wall and things haven't gone well for a few weeks, <laughs> I'll start maybe just a little bit, I'll start to say, little voice will say, I don't want to do this. The last a couple of days, that particularly is, it, it, it's also a function of having more money. So I didn't have any money, I had no choice. <laughs> I know I'm gonna do this, there's nothing else I can do anyway. There's really nothing else I don't, that I think that I can do well without a big pause in my life. But that's another thing, that people looking at, the, at your name and what you did would assume that the money was pouring in, but in fact you were properly old-fashioned broke for oh, a long stretch. Oh, hell yeah, old-fashioned broke, right on, sure was. Forever and ever and ever, until, until my middle age, and that's, that's, I've had a wonderful middle age. <laughs> it's been wonderful, wonderful. And that's had a lot to do with it, solvency. You came back with the Stooges. Mm -hmm. Now that was a big move. How did that come about? I'd heard somewhere from someone that, that Ron had said, gee, I wish Jim would give a call. So I thought, fair enough, that's good enough for me. And I called him up and asked if, if uh, he and his brother would come down and guest on my record. We are the goddamn fucking Stooges! We're happy to be here! We're fucking happy to be anywhere! 
The Stooges reunion tour has been a terrific success, attracting a whole new generation of fans to their music. This is it! This is it! Good things that have been happening for me and us, the recognition and a lot of things that come with that uh, it, it contain certain suggestions that you you just die. It, that not not literally, but figuratively, it, it just tends to ossify things more and more, and you you gain fans who probably have never, maybe they've just heard about one of your songs, <laughs> you know. Now I'm ready to close my eyes. Now I'm ready to close my mind. I'll go out now and do an entire show and be in a perfectly great mood. There's really no point, if nobody's, if I'm not getting hassled, there's no point in faking it. You know, if you see what I mean, you're like, damn, there's nobody to be angry at today, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes a problem. You have a fixed address, <laughs> things like that, you know. I, I own a shirt. It's got to be cleaned, <laughs> you know, these things. Gentility to a point. No, I want to be a dog. No, I want to be a dog. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. All right. I really enjoyed that. Cool. Me Thank too. Thank you very much. All right. You must be exhausted. Yeah.